Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I'm very excited to have my good friend, Jim Bennett, to return to the program. We're actually going to talk about the role that his father, who would later become U.S. Senator Bob Bennett, uh, played as one of uh, Howard Hughes's most trusted lieutenants. Uh, he actually did public relations for the Howard Hughes Corporation. But before we get there, actually, I, there's a couple things I want to talk about with you, uh, Jim. Um, it, before that is that what's so fascinating to me is about 15 years ago, yeah, been about 15 years ago, I um, I was uh, the Lake County Public Library in Northwest Indiana uh, actually had a copy of that book. And unfortunately, my library card had expired and I was unable to check out the book. So I never actually was able to read the book. And I ended up moving shortly thereafter out of the area. Uh, but there was a fascinating book that came out. It was called Leap of Faith. And show everybody the book that your father wrote defending the Book of Mormon. There it is. Leap of Faith, Confronting the Origins of the Book of Mormon. This is my personal signed copy. To Jim and Laurel, you make us proud with much love, Dad which is very sweet. But yep, this is the book. It came out in 2009, a year before his final run for office that was ultimately unsuccessful. Right, yeah. There was a bit of controversy around that because people thought he was writing the book in order to sort of right. get political clout for it, but he'd been writing it for the better part of seven years. And this was really a labor of love for him and something that he was very very committed to doing and very and, and i think the end result actually was th this is not a uh, this is not a a light effort this is this is a very serious work that uh, was taken very seriously by by mormon scholars and in fact when president iring spoke at my father's funeral he called this book the best defense of the book of mormon that has ever been written and I thought, geez, that would have made a nice blurb on the back of the book if if he would be have been willing to do that. But anyway. Well, that's that's great. So hold up that book one more time, folks. And I'm going to leave a link in the description. Um, hopefully I can find a link somewhere on Amazon where somebody can get a used copy because I think it's out of print. Maybe there are some new copies available out there. That's the I book. Think, I think they print it on demand. I, oh. I, I think they'll still print it for you, but they don't have like the, the way the book industry works now. They don't have piles and piles of books on pallets sitting in warehouses anymore. Sure. Yeah, and I'd love to read that book because it does seem like um, it's an interesting, well, partly because, you know, your father actually helped identify some forgeries that were written about Howard Hughes in the 70s and was able to use the same techniques to kind of make a defense of the Book of Mormon as not being a counterfeit or a forgery or a hoax as well, because he was able to identify hoaxes about and, and and able to show that in his in his in, and I, again I haven't read the book yet but the idea that the Book of Mormon is certainly not a hoax at least the which is that the argument that he's making making essentially yeah yeah he he I mean the book is actually sort of well, he wrote it right after Mitt Romney's first run for president and he thought that there would be a lot of secular interest in the Book of Mormon. And so half of the book is essentially a summary of the Book of Mormon. I find that half to be really quite tedious. I'm, I'm, I know what the Book of Mormon is. I've read the Book of Mormon. I don't need the, the lengthy summary of it. But the other half of it is him applying his experiences in the, in the Hughes organization, dealing with a number of different forgeries that came up during his time working for Howard Hughes. And those forgeries have been the subject of major motion pictures. There's a movie called Hoax, starring Richard Gere, that talks about Howard Hughes's forged autobiography. There's a movie called Melvin and Howard that uh, won Mary Steenburgen a Best Supporting Actress Award that talks about the forged Mormon will, where a will... Oh, sorry, dog showing up here in the background. It's all good. Uh, Sir, welcome on MBR. Uh you're welcome, Lucas. Say hello. We're dog sitting this guy. He's a good dog. Good dog. Very, very affectionate fellow. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there was a will when Howard Hughes died, a service station attendant in Nevada uh, was, well, he brought a will to church headquarters that gave a portion of the Hughes estate to the church, but gave one fourteenth 
of the Hughes estate to a man named Melvin Dumar, who was a service station attendant who claims to have picked up Howard Hughes hitchhiking in the Nevada desert. And that was the subject of a movie. And it's very convenient that he's the one who delivered the will to church headquarters. And it's since been proven a forgery for a number of different reasons. But the, the premise of the book is that dad took those experiences and applied the lessons from them to the Book of Mormon and compared the Book of Mormon to the Hughes forgery saying, okay, here's how forgeries work. Here's how you can discover if something is a forgery. And here's why the Book of Mormon defies that template. Fascinating. And uh, this Melvin guy, was he a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? He was. He was. He just died, I think, about three or four years ago. And there was a news article about it. He insisted that the will was was not forged. I mean, he, he you know, and there were still, I, I think there are still a handful of people that believe that it, that it wasn't. But for, for all intents and purposes, the, the will was discarded legally. It was determined to be fraudulent and, and Melvin never got any of the money. Uh, Howard Hughes, they never found a legitimate will for Howard Hughes. And so they distributed his assets, I think, to, to family members or whatever else. I'm not quite sure how it all worked. Well, fascinating. And before we get started about your father's interactions with uh, the mogul, mogul uh, uh, Howard Hughes, you had said you had a little Glenn Beck story you wanted to tell related <laughs> to your dad. Let's talk about that. Well, sure, sure. So so this book, uh, this book, this book, as I as we mentioned before, it came out about a year before my father ran for re-election. I was actually the campaign manager for my father's final campaign. And when I took that job, I thought, geez, if he loses, I'm going to feel guilty for the rest of my life. And I haven't had a day's worth of guilt from him losing. It was sort of a perfect storm. Uh, the only way he could have won that election is if he had disavowed everything that he had believed in and everything that he had done, which is what Orrin Hatch did two years later. <laughs> but uh, he wasn't willing to do that. And I was really quite proud of him for not being willing to do that. And being a senator didn't define who he was. After he lost, I think he for a day or two, he was really kind of down in the dumps. And then after that, he moved on. And, and life went on. And he, the last few years of his life were very productive and very happy. But during the campaign... This was during sort of the rise of Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck was the most popular pundit on cable television and had his Fox News program with the chalkboard and the lines and the conspiracies and everything else. And my father was very nervous that Glenn Beck was going to come after him. And dad served as a bishop in the Monument Park stake when the stake president was a man named John M. Huntsman Sr. and knew John Huntsman quite well. And John Huntsman and Glenn Beck were quite close. And so my father took a copy of this book and wrote, signed it and wrote out a message for Glenn Beck and gave it to John Huntsman and said, could you give this book to John, to Glenn Beck? And tell him I would love to speak with him and I would love to just sit down with him and talk to him because I really don't want him coming after me during this campaign. And John Huntsman said, absolutely, I will do that. And passed a copy along to Glenn Beck and came back to my father and said, Bob, don't worry about it. Glenn Beck says, thank you for the book. You don't have to worry. I'm not even going to talk about your race at all during this entire campaign. So just, just, I'm going to ignore Utah and it's not going to be a big deal. And so we just let it slide until about a month later, Glenn Beck had Mike Lee on his program, endorsed Mike Lee, said, I would vote for a mouse before I would vote for Bob Bennett. And okay, fine. So he broke his word on that, but but the thing that drove me nuts is I was listening to it, and I can remember almost word for word what Glenn Beck said. He said, you have Bob Bennett. Okay, a little bit of context. There was a guy named Cass Sunstein that the Obama administration had confirmed 
And Glenn Beck, he's a guy who used to work in the Reagan administration, but he had some private writings that were far too left wing for Glenn Beck's taste. And Glenn Beck insisted that Cass Sunstein was going to be the beginning of communism in America and had this huge conspiracy that confirming Cass Sunstein was going to end the republic. And most Republicans, including my father, voted to confirm Cass Sunstein. I can't even remember. I think it was the Office of Management and Budget that he was going to lead. And um, and so this had been Glenn Beck's bugaboo for, for weeks and weeks before dad con voted to confirm him. So after he endorsed Mike Lee, Glenn Beck said, you have Bob Bennett. You have a man who looked me in the eye. He looked me in the eye and he said, Oh, you don't have to worry about Cass Sunstein. Glenn, all his writings are just academic. You don't have to worry about him at all. And I remember hearing that as Glenn Beck said it. And I remember thinking, when did my father look Glenn Beck in the eye? Mm -hmm. And I called dad. And I said, dad, this is what Glenn Beck said. And he says, I've never looked Glenn Beck in the eye. I've never spoken to Glenn Beck. We've never had a conversation. Uh, the only interaction I've had with him is through John Huntsman. And, and I wrote a, an email to Glenn Beck. And I said, given that you have never, ever been in the same room as my father and never spoken to him, in what sense was your statement true? And I've never heard back and he's never heard back. And I've had some people uh, confront him on this because I've told this story a number of times. And at one point he told a friend of mine, oh, I was thinking of Orrin Hatch. And I'm thinking, well, okay, great. Could you say that on your program, please? Because that, more than anything else, torpedoed my father's chances with the Tea Party crowd that was follow following Glenn Beck slavishly during that time period. But it didn't matter. Glenn Beck just got the ratings he wanted. But ever since then, I thought, geez, if he's willing to make up something like that, something that insignificant, what else is that man making up? Mm -hmm. And I am grateful for the fact that his influence has waned over time. But uh, that was a really sort of obnoxious moment. And it caused me to lose all respect for Glenn Beck uh, in perpetuity. So I mm -hmm. don't know if that's consistent with the stories that we want to talk about here today. But uh, but I just appreciate you giving me a chance to share that. Yeah, no. And, and of course, uh, folks, people, I have mutual friends uh, with Glenn Beck and people have brought me up to Glenn uh, as a potential guest to, to come on my program. And Glenn, it's out there. Uh, you know, if you want to come on and clear the air on this whole thing, you're welcome to do that. And uh, get maybe we can maybe we can help build a bridge that maybe maybe you never know, Jim. NBR is. NBR has brought a lot of people together. We normally wouldn't think could be brought together. So maybe I do believe in miracles, Jim. All right. Well, that would be a miracle. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for telling that story, folks. And I'd love to hear your comments. And by the way, I remember those days. I live in a Christian community, and I would uh, spend my winters here before I moved here. I'd often spend a little bit of time down here with my parents. And I just remember right around that time, five o'clock Eastern time. Yep. Everybody was. Everybody. My every other house in this Christian community is watching Glenn Beck. He was huge in the evangelical world. Um, and still has a lot of influence. There's still a lot of people here that listen to his program. So, so that is an interesting thing that, you know, and I, I remember as an atheist <clears throat> watching his rally in Washington, D.C. And, and again, I'm viewing things from an atheistic prism at this time. And I remember watching the footage of the rally and seeing the Christian flags and the crosses and, and saying to myself, oh, I think Glenn thinks he's going to fulfill the White Horse prophecy. Oh, there's no question. Uh, Glenn, Glenn's messianic verve is terrifying because he, he genuinely believes that anything that he says, even if it's not true necessarily, is justified because he's on a mission from God to save the Constitution as it hangs by a thread. And, and I find that kind of zealotry to be really, really terrifying. And again, I'm grateful for the fact that he no longer has the kind of prominence he once had. It doesn't mean he has no prominence. He certainly still does have a, have a following. But, but those days, those Tea Party days, when Glenn Beck was the center of the universe, that was really kind of terrifying. Hmm. Well, I thanks think. for giving your perspective on that, Jim. It's always important that we hear all the different voices here. 
on NBR and you have firsthand experience. And I think it's important to tell these stories because this is part of the story of the restoration. Glenn Beck's a Latter-day Saint. You're a Latter-day Saint. Your father's a Latter-day Saint. And Howard Hughes, for whatever reason, had this, this thing for Latter-day Saints. Uh, yeah. He felt like they were one of the few groups of people that he could trust. He was a highly paranoid man. And it, so, and, and talk a little bit about, because I remember you were telling me like, as a little kid, you you swam in Howard Hughes's pool apparently, but you I pooped you, in Howard Hughes's pool. That's you pooped in Howard Hughes's pool. <laughs> Did not know that. That it. That's. I, I, I whenever you, you ever play that game, uh, two truths and a lie. Uh huh. That's always my one of my truths when I play that game. I I pooped in Howard Hughes's pool. Uh, I was three years old. Okay. So this this wasn't something I did with my full cognition intact. Uh, it was 1972. It was the Republican National Convention in uh, Florida. I think it was Miami. Um, but uh, we went as a family uh, to that convention for whatever reason. And my father, he wasn't an employee of Howard Hughes at the time. My father ran a PR firm called the Robert R. Mullen Company. And Howard Hughes was its primary client. And Howard Hughes or the Hughes organization allowed us to stay in one of his private residences in Florida. And it had an indoor pool. And I remember having a discussion with my brother as we sat in the indoor pool. And he says, well, do you know what chlorine is? Chlorine is this thing where even if you pee in a pool, the chlorine will take it out. It's the way he described it. And so I performed a scientific experiment at the age of three. <laughs> I thought, well, if it works for number one, what will it do for number two? And uh, I remember, and I remember thinking after pooping, looking at it float, and go, ah, it didn't it didn't work? And that resulted in a huge sort of caddyshack moment. They drained the pool and scrubbed it all because Howard Hughes is this hardcore germaphobe, mm -hmm. and uh, he had never been in that house. He owned it, but he had never been in that house, and I think. I made sure that he never would be in that house <laughs> as a result of my, my efforts in that regard. So that's, oh, wow. that's my brush with infamy. It's a little disgusting, but you know, I'm a three-year-old kid. What are you going to do? Well, you know, I just, I just, I just wonder how that, that imprinted you so much that you would later write a Christmas hit about well, Christmas. No, that's a different, that's a different song about poo. Yes. Uh, I, that seems to be one of my metiers. Yeah, that's the miracle of the Christmas poo. That's the story of my, my son, uh, my my infant child having a big blowout diaper uh, the, on Christmas night. And I had burned the ashes from all of our present. I, I'd burned all the wrapping paper and stuff and thrown away the hot ashes which set our garbage can on fire. And I wouldn't have known that it, it was about six minutes away from burning down our house, according to my electrician brother-in-law. Uh, but if my son hadn't had that poopy diaper and I hadn't taken it out at the moment I did, I wouldn't have noticed and the house would have caught on fire. So I consider that the miracle of the Christmas poo. And yes, I wrote a song about that and I sang it for uh, RFM's Christmas Eve Spectacular. So yes. Yes, go check that out. Go to the Mormon Discussions or Radio Free Mormon Christmas special. I was a participant as well as you were. It was a motley crew of just, uh, it, was. it was great. It was a wonderful. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was a really delightful. It was. Uh, it was It was a great mix of people. So let's get back to Howard Hughes. And right. I, I, you said you had some stories you wanted to tell. Now, this is what's fascinating. Your, your, your father, in many ways, was Howard's right-hand man, but your father actually never met him. So Never this, met him and never spoke to him. Same with Glenn Beck. He and Howard Hughes. So, so dad's contact with Howard Hughes was a man named Bill Gay, who I think is related to Bob Gay, but I'm not sure how. Bob Gay being the general authority currently. But Bill Gay and my father were missionary companions in Scotland. And Bill Gay got a job as a young man as Howard Hughes's personal driver. Hmm. So he got to know Howard Hughes, you know, not in an executive capacity, but as as you know, his chauffeur. And so dad, the Hughes organization was the client of my father's PR firm. When my father, I was born in Washington, DC, when my father was running this PR firm in Washington, DC. Uh, 
And this PR firm ended up getting him into trouble because it employed a man by the name of E. Howard Hunt, who was one of the Watergate burglars. And when Watergate broke, the White House tried to pin it on my father. They tried to say, no, no, the White House had nothing to do with it. It's, it was just this Nixon zealot, Bob Bennett, and his PR firm that did all this. And dad had to testify before grand juries. Uh, I think he testified before congressional committees. And they gave him a clean bill of health. He didn't do anything wrong, but it was enough of a, um, just the taint of scandal was enough to scare away any potential clients. And his PR firm went bankrupt. And my uncle was living in Los Angeles and working for Howard Hughes as well. And Howard Hughes was the one client who wasn't scared away, who was willing to hire dad as his in-house PR guy. So we moved to California when I was six years old. I consider myself essentially a native Californian. I wasn't born there, but I lived there all through my adolescence. Uh, my family moved back to Utah right after I graduated from high school. And I stayed in LA and went to the University of Southern California. So hmm. people assume that I grew up in Utah and I and I didn't. But dad's relationship with Howard Hughes, uh, the, the the first story that helps understand this is, is dad, when he worked at the PR firm, uh, he had formerly been the undersecretary of transportation in the Nixon administration. And so that got him a lot of contacts that helped him build his PR firm. And at one point he got a call from the, from, I think from Bill Gay and said, uh, Howard Hughes is flying to London and does not have a passport. Can you please call the Department of Transportation and arrange for Howard Hughes to be able to land in London? You know, Howard Hughes, if you've seen the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, The Aviator, he was a he was an aviator. He the thing that he loved more than anything else was flying, and he hadn't flown for years and years. But he was flying to London on this occasion, and Dad went back to the the to the Nixon administration to all his contacts back in the transportation department, and then he called Bill Gay back and said, "No, he he he's not going to be able to fly to London unless he gets a passport beforehand." And Bill Gates says, no, 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 you don't understand. He is flying to London. He is on the plane, <laughs> flying the plane to London, and he's going to land, and you need to make it possible for him to be able to, to do that without a passport. And so my father called back the Department of Transportation and then called Bill Gay back and said, okay, here's what we've arranged. He can land in London. He can stay overnight. But unless he goes to the American embassy within 24 hours of landing in London and gets a new passport, he will never be able to re-enter the United States ever again. And Howard Hughes never re-entered the United States for the rest of his life. And that was the moment he left the United States. He didn't have a passport. He wasn't willing to go and get his picture taken. He wasn't willing to go out in public. And he ended up living the rest of his days, for the most part, in Bermuda. He flew to Bermuda, and he had a coterie of people who catered to his every whim as he sort of descended into madness. When he died, he weighed 79 pounds. He had fingernails out to here. He was this frail, obsessive, compulsive man. He was storing his urine in milk bottles. He was sitting in movie theaters, private movie theaters, that he with his feet in Kleenex boxes, and I mean he 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 just he really just sort of descended into madness. And my father and a number of other people essentially ran the company on his behalf, and the entire inner circle by that point of the Hughes organization were members of the church. Mormons were the only people Howard Hughes trusted near the end of his life. So I, I want to ask, uh, first of all, I didn't realize that he spent, I, I, I thought he was holed up in a hotel in, 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 in Nevada, but actually he, I, I, I guess for whatever, I didn't know that part of the story. So he was, he never re-entered the United States. 
Well, he was holed up in a hotel in Nevada, but that was prior to, uh, this was probably 1973, okay. 73, 74, um, it would have to have been before 74 because that's when my father worked for Hughes full time. Okay. So by the time your father comes to work, he's in Bermuda and essentially he's in your Bermuda father and he's never re-entering the United States. So your but father he... and the inner circle basically are all Latter-day Saints. And the question that's I have for you is what was why did, did was it ever it the the gay ever go to your dad and explain why Howard Hughes basically only trusted Mormons? Uh no, because it was sort of par for the course for this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he had these obsessions. He had these compulsions. And for whatever reason, that sort of began to figure into his thinking. It, it would be just as difficult to explain why he was obsessed with the church as it would be to explain why, you know, he was, he wore Kleenex boxes on his feet in order to protect himself from germs. I mean, this was a man who was, who was obsessive compulsive to the point of debilitation. This was not somebody who was a functioning adult. And, and so, you know, there are all kinds of stories like that. You know, when you talk about, he was holed up in a, in a, in a hotel in Nevada. Uh, he was staying at the desert Inn, which is still, I think in, or maybe it's been torn down, but it was a, it was a big landmark on the Vegas strip for years and years. I think I think I read that it had been torn down, or maybe it's been remodeled. Anyway, uh, and he was staying, and he had a whole suite of uh, he he had actually a whole floor that he was staying in, and they came back to him and they said, "Okay, you've been staying here for far too long, and we're going to have to ask you to leave." And he said, "No, and I'm going to buy the hotel instead because he didn't want to leave, so he bought the hotel." in order to be able to stay. And there was an ice cream flavor that the banana ripple that he um, decided was the only safe thing to eat. It was the only thing he wanted to eat. And he bought gallons and gallons and gallons of banana ripple ice cream and had it served to him in the desert inn in Nevada. And, and they, they, they bought warehouses of this stuff. And then he finally went off it. Then he decided, no, I don't like it at all. I don't want any more of it. And so all the Hughes executives would give banana ripple ice cream to everybody for Christmas presents. And for, it just be, I mean, th this was just a man whose compulsion sort of drove uh, everybody around him to cater to his every whim. And, and it, it was, it, it was one of the reasons why the guys who came out and said, all right, I've been having secret meetings with Howard Hughes and we're writing his autobiography. It's one of the reasons why Clifford Irving, who's the guy who did that, it's why he was taken seriously is because that was just strange enough and weird enough to be believable because that's the way Howard Hughes sort of operated. So uh, yeah, he, he was in Nevada. He bought a bunch of hotels in Nevada and and there's a there's even now there's a campus a Howard Hughes campus of no, I, I'm saying campus I'm it's not a school but he he built a whole development and there's this sort of museum there that explains his involvement in Vegas development and politics hmm. and um but uh None of that had anything to do with kind of sound business decisions or business strategies. It was just Howard Hughes shooting in the dark and doing weird, weird stuff. Hmm. So, so yeah. So, so by the time dad came to work for him full time, Hughes was pulled up in some weird Bermuda bungalow somewhere and nobody saw him. Nobody talked to him. And that's when the forgeries began. That's when Clifford Irving said, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write the autobiography of Howard Hughes. And, and he got a hold of somebody in the Hughes organization who had given him a 
a history of the Hughes organization written from his perspective. I can't remember this man's name, but Clifford Irving had, um, he, he photocopied this sort of in the dead of night because he was given it to it was given to him. Clifford Irving was a novelist, and this guy said, "Hey, I've written this book about my time in the Hughes organization. I'd love to get your feedback on it." And Clifford Irving thought, "Oh, geez, this would be fascinating." And he went and photocopied it and stole a copy of it and gave it back to the guy who'd written it. And he used that photocopy as the basis for his forged autobiography. Okay. So we started writing this autobiography in first person uh, as Hughes. And um, he got a, McGraw Hill gave him a million dollar advance on the autobiography. And it, he said, can you please write it out to H Hughes rather than Howard Hughes? And the check was written out to H Hughes and Clifford Irving sent his wife to a Swiss bank to open up an account in the name of Helga Hughes using this H Hughes check. And uh, that was part of when they discovered that, that the check had been cashed by Helga Hughes. Uh, that was the beginning of the end and Clifford Irving's story began to unravel. But uh, so D dad was part of the Hughes organization when that was happening and he was the PR director and so he was going out to the press saying, this is a lie. Clifford Irving is not meeting with Howard Hughes. Clifford Irving is not doing all of this. And then Clifford Irving would come back and say, oh, yeah, well, they wouldn't know because they're not they're not actually meeting with Howard Hughes. I'm going to Bermuda and I'm actually meeting with him. And so they wouldn't know. And all this went on and on until Howard Hughes finally decided it was the last time anybody spoke to him uh, from the general public, or at least from the press. Howard Hughes held a press conference, but it was a phone conference. Howard Hughes did not physically show up to this press conference. Uh, you know, this is back in a time when there wasn't such a thing as a teleconference. I think this was probably the first one. And Howard Hughes, there were a bunch of reporters there that had spoken to Howard Hughes back in the day when Howard Hughes actually spoke to people. And, and they asked him a bunch of questions to determine whether or not it really was Howard Hughes on the other end of the phone line. And Howard Hughes just denounced Clifford Irving, said this is an absolute hoax, says I wish I was still in the movie business because I can't imagine a movie that would be more bizarre than this. And, and that was the end of it. So um, in the course of that, dad talks about the fact that in his book, in dad's book, he, he compares that to the Book of Mormon. And he says, uh, the thing that gave Clifford Irving credibility is that his forgery was seeded with information that people expected to be there. And, um, you know, the, the, the people who are trying to determine whether or not the autobiography was genuine. We're going to talk to the guy who had written the book that Clifford Irving was stealing from. And so that guy was going, geez, that's, he, it's filled with stuff that makes sense to me. It, everything in there is something that I would expect to be in there. So clearly it's genuine. And he, he talks about the fact that the Book of Mormon sort of defies that paradigm because everybody sort of expected it to be a history of the Indians. And that's sort of how the church and how Joseph Smith himself even sort of sold the book. This is a history of the Native Americans. I'm saying Indian because that was the phrase that they would use. And there was a, a parody of the Book of Mormon called the Book of Pukey. Yeah, yeah. That that actually has, you know, there are teepees and wigwams. Yes. And, peace pipes right. and all that kind of stuff. The stuff you would expect Fact. a history of the Indians in the 19th century to include. And mm -hmm. the Book of Mormon doesn't have any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. At the Book of Mormon, as Richard Bushman puts it, it refuses to argue its own thesis. It refuses to sort of fit into the paradigm of what a 19th century author would think the history of the Native Americans would read like. And so he he compares that, he, he says the, the, the better comparison is the is the Hughes will, 
the Melvin Dumar experience and all of that, because that 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 will was proven a forgery because it had things that people expected the Book of Mormon or not the Book of Mormon expected a Howard Hughes will to have in it. But over time, it looked increasingly ridiculous. The most notable example being Howard Hughes um, during World War II built what he called the flying boat. Yep. Or the HK-1. If you've seen the movie The Aviator, mm -hmm. it ends with the first and last flight of the HK-1. Howard Hughes built this massive boat out of pine wood. It was it it was wanted to be light enough. He was concerned that um, that German U-boats were were sinking Allied warships, and so he wanted to be able to fly uh, huge contingents of soldiers over water, so they wouldn't be shot, they wouldn't be sunk. And so he built this massive, massive plane to do that out of wood, and it was too large to fly any great distance. But he was able to fly it once to shut up a congressional committee that was investigating him. And then after that, he put it in a warehouse and left it there for 50 years. And my father talks about going to that warehouse decades after Hughes had died, and it was it was a time warp. And nobody had been in there. It was, it, it was just... They eventually put it out on display. It was on display in, in Los Angeles when I was a kid. And I, I'm not sure where it is now. They had to dismantle it and they put it somewhere else. I think it's somewhere in the Northwest. But anyway, the nickname that this plane had was the Spruce Goose. Spruce Goose, that's right. Yep. It was the Spruce Goose and everybody made fun of it. It wasn't made out of spruce. It was made out of pine. Mm -hmm. And Howard Hughes hated it hated the name Spruce Goose. And yet the Melvin Dumar will uh, has Howard Hughes giving the Spruce Goose uh, using okay. that term yep. to, I think it was the city of Long Beach. Yeah. Just that, just that right there. Just right. that enough was, was enough to say, okay, Howard Hughes would never have written that. Okay. The other smoking gun in it was that Howard Hughes made Noah Dietrich the executor of his will in the Melvin Dumar will. And he and Noah Dietrich, about two years before his death, had had a bitter, bitter parting of the ways. And so they, you know, that would have made sense to somebody who hadn't really been up close and personal with Howard Hughes. But Noah Dietrich was out of the picture when that will would have been written. Okay. And so that was another smoking gun that, yeah. okay, Howard Hughes would never have done that. Okay. So, so dad takes all of these and says, okay, forgeries look really good at the time that they're written and as time goes on, they look increasingly ridiculous. And he says the exact opposite is the case with the book of Mormon. I mean, yes, there are anachronisms in the book of Mormon and he goes through those and discusses those. And he says, but many things that were considered anachronisms in the book of Mormon at the time it was published have now been proven to be accurate in ways that the people at the time of Joseph Smith would have found ridiculous. The idea, for instance, that Native Americans had large civilizations and weren't just nomadic people that lived in teepees and wandered the plains, that they actually had cities and they, you know, all those sorts of things, that was not the common uh, wisdom, the conventional wisdom of the 19th century. And as time has gone on, civilizations that are very similar to what the kinds of civilizations that the Book of Mormon describe are far more plausible and make far more sense now than they did back then. He also talks about the idea that it was, it was laughable, beyond wor laughable beyond words that people would write down sacred things on golden plates and bury them in stone boxes and hills. And then they find the Darius plates that look exactly like the kinds of plates that Joseph Smith described, including with a stone box that looks like the kind of box that Joseph Smith described. Then you get the Dead Sea Scrolls, where you have people writing up ancient records that are buried for future civilizations to find. 
and all these kinds of things that have come out since the Book of Mormon. And so, so Dad, it, it, the thing that's most interesting about his book is this sort of comparison to the Hughes experience where you had forgeries that look plausible that now look so ridiculous that there's no way they could be plausible. Whereas you have the Book of Mormon, which looked absolutely ridiculous at the time, becoming more plausible over time. Well, and, and I think, and I just want to interject a little bit, because, you know, at the time, the 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 dom one of the dominant narratives that had pre-existed the Book of Mormon by hundreds of years was this idea that the Lost Ten Tribes built the mounds. Yeah. So if you're wanting to create something that would have been universally accepted and probably would have made a, a had a bigger following would have been to have written the, the forged the records of the lost 10 tribes this the the, the book of mormon gives us an uh, gives us a narrative that is unexpected in that way and so i think it's 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 a um it's a potential data point that i think people need to take into account and and yeah and it's interesting too because a lot of people had looked down on native americans that they weren't capable of building things and yet the Book of Mormon tells us that the the inhabitants of this land are the the uh, people that their their ancestors were the ones that built all these things, as opposed to the idea that they thought there was some lost, either a lost Christian civilization or a lost ten, ten tribes. And so it's it's just kind of interesting that the Book of Mormon didn't give the narrative that people would have expected for that time and place. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I encountered this when I when I wrote my reply to the CES letter. Uh, the CES letter focuses heavily on different secular explanations for the Book of Mormon's existence and leans into the view of the Hebrews, which gets, you know, whenever anybody says the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the view of the Hebrews, I always think, okay, tell me you haven't read the view of the Hebrews without telling me you haven't read the view of the Hebrews. Because I actually read the whole thing while I was responding to the CES letter. And the view, and view of the Hebrews is an is a is a polemical essay. It's not a story. It's not a narrative. I mean, you only have to read a paragraph of it to realize that it's not been the, the Book of Mormon did not plagiarize from it. But the the idea is that okay, Joseph Smith wrote the book read read the book of the the uh, blah, blah. my brain is all over the place. Joseph Smith read View of the Hebrews and ripped off all the ideas and incorporated them in the Book of Mormon. And the reality is that, no, he didn't. The view of, view of the Hebrews does exactly what you're talking about, and it posits that the Native Americans are descendants of the Lost Ten Tribes. And the Book of Mormon barely mentions the Lost Ten Tribes. Lehi is a descendant of Manasseh. He's a descendant of Joseph, not one of the Lost Ten Tribes. And and the story, I mean, all of the arguments that are in the book view of the Hebrews that try to argue that the Native Americans are of Israelite descent, none of those arguments appear in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith, everybody today sort of expects the Book of Mormon to reflect the worldview of view of the Hebrews, and it absolutely does not. Uh, at least not beyond, you know, everybody takes the sort of wide, so, well, you know, the view of the Hebrews says that they're, that the Native Americans are descended from the Israelites, and so does the Book of Mormon, and so therefore they're the same thing. And just that broad thematic similarity is the only thing that the two books have in common. And it's like It's like saying every book about World War II is plagiarized from each other. It, it, it's it, you have a very very broad theme and none of the explanations for how joseph smith came up with his two hundred and sixty five thousand words uh none of them hold water none of almost all of them require as much miraculous intervention as gold plates in an angel and so uh, that that's pretty much the thesis of my father's book which is, okay, if you don't think that Joseph Smith wrote it, or if you don't think that that it came from the gold plates and that Joseph Smith was, was given the power to translate by the gift and power of God, then you have to define who wrote it. 
And this was, I, I just did a podcast with Ian Wilkes on my Inside Out podcast where uh, we played my father's final fireside. You know, my father suffered from pancreatic cancer in the last two years of his life and he thought he had beaten it and uh, he went back and discovered that it had metastasized. And he was told he only had about six months to live. And then about a month after that, he had a stroke. And that stroke is essentially what took his life. We all gathered around his bedside for the last three weeks of his life. But the day before his stroke, he gave a fireside in the Arlington Ward in Virginia. He was asked by his bishop, a man named Aaron Sherinian, who is the new PR director for the church. But the uh, Bishop Sherinian asked him to give this fireside about his book and about the Book of Mormon. And dad, for weeks leading up to the fireside, his mantra was, I've got to stay alive for the fireside. And he did. He stayed alive for the fireside. He gave a very powerful fireside that was recorded. It's a very poor recording on somebody's iPhone who was sitting in the audience. But we have that recording and it, we played it for our audience. Hmm. And, and the central message was, he said, the Book of Mormon exists. And that means somebody wrote it. You have to explain who wrote it. Uh, it can't be waved away. And I, I have yet to encounter a, a theory of a, a secular explanation for the Book of Mormon's existence that I find persuasive. Because if you say, okay, this is not a miraculous, a marvelous work and a wonder from God. Okay, so did Joseph Smith write it? Did Joseph Smith plagiarize it from somebody else? Did somebody else write it? Did a group of people write it? And in Dad's book, he goes through each of those theories, and they all have major, major problems. And he says, if you were to talk to somebody in the 19th century, uh, of the three options, the options are God wrote it, Joseph Smith wrote it, third party wrote it. You know, some other, some other third party wrote it. He says, if you were to present those three options to a 19th century audience, the one they would find least plausible would be the idea that Joseph Smith wrote it. Hmm. Because Joseph Smith's reputation was somebody who was uneducated, didn't have the ability to do that. All of the criticism early on was that this ignorant bumpkin suddenly right. thinks that he can write the Bible. Right. And, you know, it wasn't until probably 50 to 60 years after Joseph Smith's death, where people had forgotten, you know, where the generation that actually knew him in life uh, had passed away with him, that people started to say, okay, the most likely explanation is that Joseph Smith came up with this himself and that Joseph Smith wrote it. And dad, dad's book just talks about why that's such a problematic proposition. And the thing that I find remarkable about that idea is that if you look at the Book of Mormon manuscript, uh, scholars pretty in and out of the church pretty much agree that it's a dictated document and that it's a first draft. You know, they didn't go back and revise over and over again. Joseph Smith just sort of dictated this off. And it and all the accounts say he didn't have he wasn't reading from a manuscript. I don't I don't know if he'd shoved something into the hat and was trying to read off off that, but that wouldn't work necessarily. Uh he, he was he was reciting this. So if, if he had prepared it beforehand, he had memorized the entire Book of Mormon, and was just reading it off. Anybody that's written anything of any length can tell you how difficult it is to produce something of any quality in a first draft. The goal of a first draft is just to get it on paper. And then it's you rewrite it, you rewrite it, you rewrite it over and over and over again until you finally get it to that point. The Book of Mormon is a first draft. That, to me... You know, a, a, a 265,000 word book that's a first draft that goes in the pub, that gets published that isn't total meandering nonsense. Uh, that's a miracle. I, I mean, you have to go through all of those kinds of things to be able to determine uh, 
how the Book of Mormon came to be, and you run into problems no matter where you go. Oh, that's so, fascinating. Of course, see, it doesn't matter what the subject of my show is. If the Book of Mormon comes into the picture, we're just going to talk about it because I'm a Book of Mormon guy. About that. And, and I love it. I love that. I, I, I actually wasn't thinking of you as the C, the writing the C. I knew that you did, but I wasn't thinking no. about that. And then I was more of thinking about your dad. It was keying in on your dad's book, but it's really a fascinating, uh, and you know, it's, it's probably been eight, nine years now that since I've read the CES letter, and I imagine I may have come across your work. This would have been as an atheist reading the CES letter as well. And I, I do think I did read your response, but I don't remember. Uh, it's been a while. Um, I just want to kind of circle back a little bit to uh, Howard Hughes um, sure. while, we, while we start wrapping Sorry. this conversation up. I well, this far is my field for you. Oh no, that's fine. Oh no, that's that's what I love about this show is I don't I don't I don't even have an outline. <laughs> I, I'm just like Joseph in, in many ways. It's just we just we do the first draft <laughs> right away. <laughs> the first draft, <laughs> right? And so I I want to uh, just kind of talk about uh, your father. Um, he's hired to work for Howard Hughes. And it's all Latter-day Saints that are in his inner circle. And the question I have for you is, all these people knew that Howard was off his rocker. How is it that they couldn't have kind of as a board, like, did they have a board of directors? Did they have some means of being able to wrest control of the organization from Howard? Would that have been possible? Or were all these people employed by him and he could have just fired him if they tried to do that? Because to me, I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar corporation that's being run by a madman, essentially. And people like your father would, probably be aware of this why not why why weren't there steps to try to kind of take control of this of this organization and and not let it like happen what happened <laughs> that is a very good question to which i don't know if i have a satisfactory answer because i think i'm speculating here it would depend on the corporate structure of the hughes organization the name of the company was suma as in summa cum laude, as in, you know, the, the, the pinnacle, the summit. Um, and, and I think it was entirely privately held that, that Howard Hughes owned it 100%, so it wasn't subject to any kind of board of directors that would have had the ability to remove him. But as I say that, I know that Hughes had a number of different companies that were owned by Suma. For instance, Howard Hughes had his own airline, Hughes Air West. At one point, Howard Hughes owned TWA. And that, I mean, that was a huge, or, I mean, that was a huge part of his, of his wealth. He ended up selling it and creating his own airline called Hughes Air West, which was kind of nice because while dad worked for the Hughes organization, we were able to fly free on Hughes Air West. Uh, they had really funny, the, the, the planes were painted funny, I remember. They had like faces on them or something. Uh, but uh, I, I think the corporate structure was such that it was not possible to wrest control. But I also think some of those companies uh, were publicly traded. Some of the companies that were owned by the parent organization, because I think Hughes Air West was publicly traded. Okay. I know TWA was publicly traded. And that, that he ended up having to sell his shares in TWA to save his fortune. So, but I, I, I think the, the problem was that that at its core, the parent company was solely owned by Howard Hughes and there was no way of getting, getting, getting him out of there. Uh, I don't know also though, that there was really an appetite for removing him. Mm, okay. Because he wasn't doing anything. Okay. I mean, it wasn't that he was a madman making mad decisions. Maybe that had been the case in years prior when he was more functional. He was essentially an invalid. Okay. He was essentially somebody who, who wasn't a, making any decisions on anybody's behalf. And so I don't really think there was a great incentive to remove him so much because he wasn't really in the way of doing anything. And all of these companies were going about their business and were making a great deal of money and doing quite well. Uh, so... So it wasn't that hmm. this tyrant was, yeah, was huh. wrecking everything. Interesting. I yeah, I, I think that's the answer to that. I, I tell you. So I guess if we were to summarize your father, what his thoughts being part of the Hughes organization, um, obviously that was a really important thing. Um, what was his 
overall view of Howard Hughes. Obviously, never met him, never looked him in the eyes. Never but, looked him in the eye. But just to tell, what, what what was your father's take on him? I don't know. Well, I remember seeing the movie The Aviator. Okay. Did your uh, dad watch it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk yeah, about it. Yeah, I, I about may it. have even seen it with him. Okay. I'm trying to remember because I know I discussed it with him right after seeing it. Okay. Because at that point in my life, I mean, I'd only he heard, um, you know, bits and scraps of his experience with Hughes. I'd never really sort of sat down and talked to him. And then I watched that movie and you, you see Howard Hughes sort of descend into madness in that movie. And it, it ends with him saying the phrase, the wave of the future over and over again. He just can't stop saying this phrase. And you can see that he's pretty much lost his mind. And I remember saying, okay, dad, how accurate is this? And he said, it's very accurate, but it's the time frame is compressed. He says he didn't lose his mind right after. I mean, there, there's a scene, for instance, where he's negotiating uh, the sale of TWA with Alec Baldwin, where Leonardo DiCaprio as Howard Hughes is talking to Alec Baldwin, and I don't remember what the name of his character was. But Leonardo DiCaprio is in a movie theater that he's been watching the movies over and over, and he's got Kleenex boxes on his feet, and he's already starting to collect his urine in jars and all the gross stuff that he says none of that happened until 10 15 years after the spruce goose flew you know so so they 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 end up mashing all of this stuff in earlier than it than it actually happened but he says but in terms of what actually happened that is what actually happened that is how he ended up living his life mm -hmm. i don't know that he ever sort of offered an assessment of howard hughes as a person uh only because I, I don't think, I mean, he didn't really have a relationship with Howard Hughes as a person. Mm. In his mind, Howard Hughes was essentially the corporate entity that he worked for. It's like, what's your, if you, it's like working for McDonald's and what's your opinion of McDonald's as a person? Well, McDonald's is the company. Howard Hughes, by that point, Which is the time my dad started working for him, Howard Hughes was sort of a phantom. Yeah. And it was the company that was, that was preoccupied, that he was oh. preoccupied with. Well, that's that's just really, really interesting, uh, Jim. Thanks. I, I, was there any other stuff about Howard Hughes and your father you wanted to relate to the audience before we wrap this up? Um, like an I, anecdote, a story that maybe you think would be of interest. Well, so I, um, when I went to the University of Southern California, uh, my parents had already moved back to Utah, and I stayed in Los Angeles and lived with. Howard and Medine Anderson. Howard Anderson was the stake president of the Los Angeles, California stake. Medine Anderson is my wife, my wife, my mother's sister. That's a Freudian slip, isn't it? Uh, so my aunt, this is my aunt and uncle. And Howard was uh, also worked for Howard Hughes. Howard Anderson also worked for Howard Hughes and was actually instrumental in getting dad the job moving him to Los Angeles. And uh, Howard Anderson would probably be the guy to have talked to. He since passed away as well. But he would have been the guy to talk to about Howard Hughes as a person. I'm not sure if Howard Anderson ever met him, and I'm not even sure what Howard's um, position was. But uh, Howard obviously was a Latter-day Saint. But Howard... Anderson, there are two, two Howards here. So I'm going to Anderson and Hughes. Anderson uh, had a screening room in his office in, in uh, Los Angeles that uh, harked back to Howard Hughes's time in the movie business. Anderson related to, to Hughes from Hughes's time as a movie mogul. And that was sort of and had great affection for him as a result of that. Hmm. If they were both alive, my father and Howard Anderson, I and I wanted to know about, okay, what do you think of Howard Hughes as a person? I would have spent all of my time talking to my uncle Howard hmm. about Hughes and no time at all talking to my father. My father just really had no connection to it. Whereas my uncle was really enmeshed in the movie business and would talk about 
just how wild it was, you know, that Hughes, <laughs> Hughes got in trouble for making dirty movies. He made a movie called um, The Moon is Blue. There's a whole MASH episode about it. In, in MASH, they want to get a hold of this dirty movie that Howard Hughes has made called The Moon is Blue. And they spend all their entire time to try to get a hold of it. And finally, at the end of the thing, they, they get a copy of it and they watch it. And the reason it was considered a dirty movie because, is because at one point, one of the characters says that she's a virgin. And that's it. And, and that was considered scandalous at the time. <laughs> and and my uncle Howard got a big kick out of that and just thought it was so fun how Howard Hughes sort of pushed the boundaries of movie making. And, you know, it, they, they in the movie The Aviator, they talk about the fact that he got something like 54 different aircraft to film one of these movies that was it had these dogfights. And he kept waiting for when there were enough clouds in the sky to be able to film them so that the dogfights look more dramatic because they could be set against the clouds. And this cost millions and millions and millions of dollars because Howard Hughes was just wasting all his money. And then he made the movie, looked at it and went, ah, I don't like it that much and made it again, scrapped the original movie and did it all over again. So uh, my uncle had tremendous affection for Howard Hughes's eccentricities in that regard. Uh, but my dad, he, he never, ever, ever talked about Howard Hughes at all. Hmm. Uh, it was just sort of one of his jobs. My father, people don't realize my father's career was very, very checkered. You know, after Watergate, hmm. he, he wanted to run for office as a young man. He didn't run for office until he was 59 years old. And the reason he couldn't run for office as a young man was that Watergate had tainted his reputation in Washington. And even when he ran for office at 59, Watergate became front and center as his Democratic opponent tried to tar him with it. Uh, there was even a time when people thought my father was deep throat. And, and uh, I wanted to write a book called My Father Deep Throat. And just like Clifford Irving writing a book about Howard Hughes, my dad would deny it, but then that would you know, increase the book sales and it would have been great. But then I would have ruined my relationship with my father and that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but so, so, I mean, he went after he moved to California and Howard Hughes died. Dad lost his job there. He ended up working for the Osmonds as the Osmonds PR director. Oh, okay. And then the Donnie and Marie show got canceled and the <laughs> Osmonds essentially went bankrupt. So he lost his job there. <laughs> and then he started all of these startups that went nowhere. And for most of my adolescence my father was essentially unemployed hmm. and just sort of struggling trying to figure out what to do and it wasn't until he ended up working for the company that's now franklin covey he was the first oh, yeah. ceo of what was then called the franklin institute mm -hmm. which then became franklin quest mm -hmm. and then merged with covey and became franklin covey and that company went public and made him a multimillionaire, and that allowed him to run for the senate but, you know, everybody just assumes that, oh, yeah, Jim Bennett, well, you grew up in as sort of Salt Lake royalty. It's like, no, I grew up with an unemployed father in the San Fernando Valley in California. Uh, nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew who he was. Uh, but Howard Hughes is what brought us to Los Angeles. And, um, and so it's a big part of my history, whether I want it to be or not. Hmm. I love it. I love. I love it. What a what a great some great stories. Fascinating and and you know look we got cats and dogs getting along with each other in the background. Yeah, yeah. I think there's <laughs> this cat. This cat crawled into the base of my electric car the other day, and we drove around town with her and didn't realize she was there, and then she crawled out of it. <laughs> she should be dead. So anyway. Wow. Well, I was going to say, we, if we can get cats and dogs getting along, maybe we can get Glenn Beck and Jim Bennett to, in, to get along. Uh, we'll, I don't we'll see. know. Well, we'll I'm, see. I'm a peacemaker. I'm a believer. I'm a positive person. So I'm a positive thinker. So you never know. I'm hopeful. Either way, Jim, I just want to say it was a real joy uh, talking to you with us this morning. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking your time to tell some really interesting stories about your father and his relationship with Howard Hughes and also with your uncle, but also just this little great riff that we did on the Book of Mormon today. It's always great having you on. Thanks for coming on.
Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. And so, folks, I'd like to hear your comments. What do you think? Uh, did What do you think of Howard Hughes back in the day? Uh, what did you think of the Aviator movie? I always thought that I actually enjoyed that movie. Um, what What did you think? What do you think about Jim's uh, in his father's defense of the Book of Mormon? We're always interested in having interesting conversations in the discussion. And so let's start 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 this up. Start us up with some great conversations. And by the way, just so you know, there's haters out there, this, uh, evangelical critics who really despise the fact that I'm a friend of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a friend of the Restoration and somebody who really uh, finds value in the Book of Mormon. Um, I just want to say that um, please do yourself a favor and rather than just attack the thumbnail or attack the post, why don't you actually watch my videos? I've even sent some videos to some of my critics and it does not appear that they're watching any of them. And so for those of you who are criticizing me, nine times out of 10, they're doing it out of ignorance. That's why I rarely respond to them because I really feel like it's just a waste of my time. So fortunately I have a platform and I'm able to tell my story and uh, don't have to kowtow to the bullies because that won't happen folks anytime soon. All right, well, there's gonna be links in the description to everything we talked about. Also links in the description. Uh, so we'll try to get your dad's book in there. Um, uh, for those of you who'd like to financially support the channel, uh, mormonbookreviews.com, and uh, Venmo and PayPal and Patreon. I want to thank all those of you who are financially supporting Mormon Book Reviews. Couldn't do it without you. And remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.